Um, today we are talking about quasars and active galactic nuclei. So I'm going to start out talking about the discovery of quasars and try to lead you through the scientific process and the surprises that were there. Um, we're going to revisit redshift, an idea we've seen before, but in the context of quasars. And then we'll try to answer the question, what are quasars, by coming up with a model and connecting it to all the observational evidence that we need to explain with that model. So starting out with the discovery of quasars. So this is what a quasar looks like in an optical image. It kind of looks like a star, right? When we did Galaxy Zoo, we, stars look like this. Um, this one's a little special. There's a little jet here. But maybe just looking at this image for the first time, you wouldn't say, oh, this is a galaxy. You would probably say this is a star. So this is um, what astronomers were up to in the 1960s. We're looking at radio sources of all different kinds. And most of the radio sources that we knew of were extended on the sky, meaning that they were a, a large size instead of a small source, like a point source, like a star. But um, astronomers were hunting for small point radio sources, uh, similar to stars. And what they found were these objects that mostly looked like stars. They were faint blue in um, optical images, but they had weird spectra. This spectrum doesn't really look like a stellar spectrum. Um, and so this was kind of a puzzle at the time. What was this weird radio object making this bizarre spectrum? that looks like a star to the eye, but otherwise doesn't seem like one. So because of this kind of, um, I guess, puzzling situation, they called them radio stars due to the fact that they look like stars, but they emit radio. Um, and now they're called quasars, quasi-stellar, meaning they kind of look like stars, radio sources, pretty obvious what that means. So what do I mean when I say this spectrum doesn't look like a star? Maybe you would need a refresher. It's been a little while since we thought about spectra. So um, stars have what we call thermal spectra. If we look at the intensity of light in different wavelength range, um, in the visible in particular is highlighted in this rainbow area, then the most uh, intensity from a star is put out in the visible range. And it tends to peak and then drop off, right? This is a black body curve, a thermal spectrum. But quasars do not have what we would call a stellar spectral line shape. They have non-stellar spectra um, and they're all a little bit different. So here's that same spectrum we just saw from the quasar on the previous slide. Um, the rainbows here match the visible range. And you know, it doesn't look like this. You can't see a clear peak that falls off to both shorter and longer wavelengths in this particular spectrum. So here's this spectrum, uh, fairly similar, right, to the, to the previous one. It basically looks like a curve that has more radiation at lower wavelengths and less at longer wavelengths, um, but it's not quite in the same range and the spikes in the spectrum are not quite at the same place either. And then this one is another example, fairly flat this time, right? Um, but it still has the characteristic more intensity at short wavelengths, less at long wavelengths. And then finally, here's, oops, one more example that looks even more linear. And all of the quasar spectra that I just showed you have more or less this line shape. They fall off to lower intensities at long wavelengths. That's really all they all have in common. And other than that, they, they, you know, they have, some of them have spikes, but those spikes can be in different places. So it's not very clear that these are all related objects. So these peaks, those kind of spikes I was just talking about, these are what we would call emission peaks. So emission peaks come from specific atoms or molecules that produce light of a given wavelength. They're basically the opposite of the absorption peaks that help us to fingerprint the chemical composition of like a star or a galaxy. So these emission peaks are a clue to the composition of the quasar. And we can pick out their different wavelengths and figure out where they, you know, which elements they should match. But what we found was they didn't match anything. Um, but 
the Dutch astronomer Martin Schmidt recognized that the spacing between the lines is the same spacing as the hydrogen spectrum, but really far redshifted. All right, so we'll talk about exactly how far here in a second. But this was a big step to recognize that quasars actually were, um, you know, made of things we knew, hydrogen. They weren't some kind of, you know, new and exotic elements. They were familiar things, but highly, highly redshifted. 